My name is Peter Tay and I trade as Tate Decor, Fairground Art. Uh, I started in 1976 and been continuously doing Fairground as the main source of uh, work since then. A uh, little bit of sign writing you know, over the years but the problem with sign writing is it's a bit too boring. It's, uh, it's a clever thing to do and once you've got at it, then you've got plenty of work. You used to have plenty of work these days. pre space vinyl letters have taken over. But the fairground side of things has always been more interesting to me through the ex exaggerated letter forms and the colours. That's what got me in it in, you know, in the first place. Uh, getting into fairgrounds, I started in the early 50s. I was only seven years old and I met a lad called Ken Mellers and we both had an interest in dinky toys at the time. We were collecting every dinky toy we could get our hands on and uh, we, we went to the transport side of things. We gradually got into fairground transport and sooner or later decided to start making models of the transport and the rides and the stalls. So. That went on till the mid 60s and then I thought well the models are good enough now to get the showmen to come around and uh, give their opinions which they did in no uncertain terms. Uh, they more or less all said well your models are lovely but your paintwork is rubbish you need to go and see a man called Fred Fowl who was based in Ballam and so plucked up courage in 1970 went to see Fred, welcomed me with open arms, such a nice man, couldn't want to meet a nicer fella. Anything I asked him, he immediately told me the answer, he did demos, he explained everything, and he, he was chuffed to bits because someone was taking an interest in what he was doing other than the showman. So, uh, at the time, I worked in a cabinets factory in Vic Allums in Langley Mill, and we made television and hi-fi cabinets. Uh, and I got made redundant from there in November 75. Uh, my dad died in February 76. I kind of went off the rails a bit, went to pieces a bit, and uh, gradually recovered through the year. And then Belper, October Fair 1976, I went to the fair to basically just well, just brighten things up a bit in my life and met Albert Holland and uh, I didn't really know him before that uh, but seemed to click okay and uh, he said, well, if you've been made redundant, you're out of work and you're making fairground things, you know, and painting them, he said, surely painting something that big has got to be easier than painting something that big. So my cyclone and rails want painting. How do you fancy setting up and doing them? Which I did, and that was the first job. Tate Decor was born on the 23rd of November 1976 and continued ever since. Now, Albert was a very shrewd man, still is a very shrewd man, and uh, he taught me a lot from the showman's point of view. Luckily, I already knew hundreds and hundreds of showmen through being an enthusiast and making models. I used to go around all the fairs, taking pictures, and so I got to know lots and lots of them anyway. But it's a different thing being an enthusiast with a friendly approach to actually doing it in a business fashion. So luckily, Albert guided me and uh, we got the first job done just in time by the skin of my teeth. It turned out to be a much, much bigger job than I expected. Uh, but I learned at that stage uh, mass production techniques, which, although Fred had taught me a lot, he hadn't actually taught me to do mass production. Uh, so that was a learning curve, that one. But anyway, we got through it and the work started to flow in. People saw what I'd done for Albert, they liked it, so they all started queuing up. Didn't know which way to turn in no time at all. And it's been like that for the majority of the time. 
you get odd lulls, you know, there's little gaps here and there and there was a period when, in the early 80s, when I decided to go back to signs and do a little bit more in that respect, but it soon got boring and I went back to fairs and I've been with it ever since. My interest in fairground art stems from the models that Ken and myself made. Uh, Ken didn't want to paint anything, but uh, he enjoyed making the models. Uh, and I did a little bit of model making as well, but I went on to the painting side. And that traditional cream background that we had then, which is this kind of artwork, that was what Fred did, Fred Fowl, uh, and that's what I was putting on the models at the time. As time went on, uh, tastes and styles change, you've always got to keep your finger on the pulse. Showmen are notorious for always wanting to have the latest styles, fashions and effects that are out there. So as Fred had to do back in the day, and it was advised by his mentor, which was Edwin Hall, he kept his eye on the press and in the media for any ideas he could pick up and incorporate them into his fairground artwork. And so I followed suit. He taught me to do that and I carried on doing it all the way through. Even now, everywhere I go, I'm looking. If I see a new colour or like on the telly, you see an advert and there's a certain effect there. And I think, can we use that? Be great if we can. Uh, so we'll put that in the brain there and keep it to one side because one day you never know, you might need it. We went through a period at the end of the... Uh, 70s into the beginning of the 80s of gold and chrome lettering. That was the fad at the time. All the showmen wanted that. Uh, and so I had to incorporate that. So instead of nice fishtail fairground letters, we got block chrome and gold effect letters with sparkles, star sparkles on. Uh, just to modernise it all up. With darker backgrounds, the, the traditional cream gave way to the more modern, darker colours, which is all part of the effect, I suppose. You've got, you know, you've got to move with the times, so we've got to get as many new ideas in as we can. So Fred was my mentor, uh, and his mentor was Edwin Hall. As time's gone on, and I've developed skills and different techniques, I've also seen it from a different angle. And I can say that the, the Edwin Hall stuff appeals to me more now, the old Lakin style and the Edwin Hall style appeals to me more than anything else. I seem to be looking back at artwork, not forward. Uh, I'm on the brink of retirement, I'm 74 now, and could have retired 10 years ago but didn't, wanted to keep going. And uh, at that time, I suppose, we were going through a period where there was lots and lots of work, tons of work, and no problem. But as the time's gone on, the showmen have had to move, as we say, they've had to move with the times. And there was a period when airbrushing took over from brushwork, traditional brushwork. Everybody wanted airbrushing, and they got it. Paul Wright was the leader, for me anyway, in the world of airbrushing on fairgrounds. He set all the, the trends and the styles. Everyone else copied him, just like I and everyone else copied Fred in the traditional vein earlier than that. So then all of a sudden overnight, someone invented printing on, on vinyl and on dye bond, and that took over from airbrushing. Still a lot of airbrushing being done, but the printing is quicker, cheaper, and less hassle, and not as messy. So that seems to be the trend at the moment. That, that is the main thing. Speed is what they want. There's Joby Carter. Now Joby does basically just traditional artwork and sign writing courses. Joby has opened up a whole new field there 
because we've now got people coming into it who have got no actual interest in fairs, but they like to do the fairground art. Uh, Aaron Stevens, he's a classic example. He went one of Joby's courses and uh, came out really with flying colours, top marks. And now he's Joby's right hand man at painting all the stuff. Uh, he does a quite a bit of fairground uh, stuff based on Fred's style, but as we all do, his own style is now coming through, gradually creeping in, little bit at a time. You've got uh, George Eben. George is a showman. He does as much in a month as I was doing in six months. He's very, very, very fast. But he's younger than me, so I suppose you know that explains some of it. There's Tom Tooley. Tom Tooley's just coming on the scene. Uh, he's done a couple of waltzes and he's taking off now. Uh, he spent quite a lot of time here picking up all the the basics. Uh, guided him as much as I could, and now he's his own free will. He's his own agent to do what he wants. Uh, if I can support him, I will do. Uh, we want more people to come into it. I do quite a few uh, commissions, uh, specialist little little boards with whatever the customer wants on it, and I do it in a fairground style. And that's probably as far as that person wants to go in collecting fairground art, just to have something to hang on the wall. I think really the the way forward for the fairground is to look at people like like say Tom Tooley, George Eben, uh, and they are going to move it forward. Uh, the many paints we've used over the years, uh, basically uh, professional paints and not domestic use. So the mass amount of paint that Fred Fowl used for instance back in the day was Keeps. Keeps were down in Beckenham in Kent they made a full range of, of paints for the sign writing industry and Fred capitalized on that and he got them to make his range of flamboyant paints. There's been quite a few makes of flamboyant over the years and um, some were successful, some weren't. Some faded quickly, some didn't. Uh, Keeps seemed to have gone on longer than any of the others uh, until they had a disastrous fire and the, the business closed down. That was the end of Keeps. Uh, their sign writing paints, back in the day, more or less any sign writer you would see anywhere up and down the country would be using one of Keeps' colours, if not more, sometimes they relied entirely on Keeps. They were really a big, big name. Uh, later, uh, we went on to Masons, for me anyway, because they were just down the road in Derby. So, very handy. Uh, I used all Masons base colours, I standardised on them, uh, and used certain colours to tint, to make different shades. Uh, so, we'd start with uh, a deep blue, and add white to it and get three or four shades of blue, the same with green uh, and so on. Uh, then uh, Masons went out of business. Then I discovered HMG in Manchester. HMG are the nearest thing to Masons and the nearest thing to a traditional uh, paint manufacturer in Britain. And they do more or less whatever you want. You can have any colour in any finish that you want. I stick now with HMG most of the time. Um, when it comes to the flamboyance, the yellow one is the popular one, which is very hard to get now because the pigments used back in the day to make that are now considered toxic. So uh, various firms have had a go at trying to make a substitute. Not really any of them have come up with a, a successful one. But there's, there's the magenta and there's uh, the blues and greens 
they're all uh, all easily obtainable from firms like Rights of Limb, Craftmaster. Uh, they are the uh, two main ones. There's a, uh, AS Handover in London. They also do a range of flamboyants. Uh, and then for a, a lot of sign writers today, uh, one shot fills the bill. That's an American paint. Uh, they have a, a, a base over here and they sponsor lots of sign writing uh, exhibitions and meets, as they call them. Uh, letterheads meets, they're popular. Uh, and one shot will supply them with a full range of paints to play with for the weekend. Uh, these two are metallics or pearlescents, if you prefer to call it that. And then we come on to varnish now. I used to love Mason's varnish. That was my favourite varnish of all time. But when they disappeared and I went to HMG, I moved on to their uh, polyurethane one. A lot of sign writers don't like polyurethane, but I'm afraid that the old oil uh, varnishes tend to go brown too quickly. The polyurethanes stay clearer longer. Uh, and then we've got the traditional Craftmaster uh, latest varnish as well. Now, in terms of brushes, uh, we've got different sizes of what are called pencils, writer's pencils for sign writing quickly. We've got filling in brushes, which are called one, uh, one strokes. <coughs> um, all sizes available. And then we've got the liners. This one you would use to do a fine black line. Uh, of course, we've got the special number one black liner which is uh, a Tate uh, original. After years of doing traditional, what I class traditional cream background artwork, I realized that things needed to move on. And the showman, renowned for always wanting the latest fad or whatever it is, happens to be in fashion, so they wanted something more modern. A lot of them liked the neon effect, uh, and so we had to do a scroll work that was more modern, if you like. Uh, and so this came about because Maxwell's were the first to do it. They did a Max, what was called a Maxwell worm, uh, and they did it first. And I just copied it and adapted it and did my version of it and this became the tape worm. This is an experimental one I did with the uh, rag rolling in the middle and pearlescent colours for the background. The rag rolling has really taken off with the, a lot of showmen. Um, there's, there's quite a few of them uh, that really, really like that style. It's easy to do, it's quick to do and it's effective. It's the modern marble really, you could say, I think. But as time has gone on now, the tapeworm has crept in and it's gradually starting to replace the old cream traditional that we loved in the first place. It's gradually crept in and crept in. And it, at the same time, in the world of spray, the picture work has taken over to the point where you've either got one extreme or the other. You've either got this or you've got pictures. You've got nothing in between. Showmen over the years have built up all sorts of, of uh, superstitions regarding colours on their equipment. Some don't like green, some don't like blue, some don't like black. But in general, I think that a fair balance of all colours is the secret to success. In the case of this one, that's my own choice of colours for that particular board. But in the traditional vein again, that's my own choice of colours. And that one was adopted by Jackson's for quite a lot of the work I did, so it couldn't be that much wrong with it. Uh, today, the modern patterns, the tapeworms, are usually uh, maroons, blacks and purples. They're the favourite colours, some pinks as well, uh, but no cream. 
no cream at all today, not on the modern rides. It's, it's a style I like, the cream background, but it's dated, so it's best really, I think, if they tell me what they don't like rather than what they do like, because if you know what they don't like, you can't go wrong really. So I just, that's what I just do, I get all the photos out, let them have a good look through them, and eventually we come to some kind of compromise. Right, this, this one is Anderton and Rowland City of Plymouth Walter. Uh, it was an enormous front, it filled the whole of the back wall of the workshop. Uh, a lot, a lot of work, but from the, the original drawn on stage, gradually filling all the colours in, it ended up like that, which is uh, pretty colourful, and that pleased them. They had a second waltzer, Anderton and Rowlands, uh, which was uh, more modern in appearance this time. They wanted to go for something totally different. So we've got a blank canvas there, which is always nice to start with. Uh, and we end up with something pretty colourful. Uh, we've got, uh, we've got quite a few here, different ones that we've done over the years. And the thing with it is, we're using traditional paints here. They've got to be brushed and not sprayed, basically. You, you can spray them, but they are designed to be brushed. Uh, and so it takes such a lot of processes, such a long time to build up from a drawn on panel to that. Uh, we, have to, we have to do a little bit of spraying. This, this is the neon effect, which came in more or less in the mid 80s, got very popular with showmen. They still like it now. Uh, so we'd have to do a little bit of neon here and there just to liven it up. That's the, uh, the black lining palette. Black lining's always the crisp part of the job, brings it all alive. Until that stage, it's, you know, it's pretty, uh, pretty dead. And then all of a sudden that, that really brings it And that's uh, actually doing a bit of spray work there. Neon effects are pretty easy to do. You start with a white base and just spray the colours around it. And then you end up with the finished water. Of uh, course, some time during the 80s, I uh, did quite a lot of work for Jackson's at Congleton. They were the main opposition to George Maxwell and Sons of Musselburgh. Uh, both firms made quite a number of waltzers over the years. And uh, luckily for me, Jackson's asked me if I could paint a waltzer for them, uh, for uh, Rill, for the amusement park. So I said I could. And um, it was Arthur Jackson who approached me in the first place. He used to do the paintwork for Jackson's and Congleton anyway, but as he got older, the hands got shaky and he took it upon himself not to do any more. So he said, uh, would you like to paint a wall, sir? And I said, yes, very much. Uh, so this is the first one I did for them. This, this is on uh, the amusement park at, at Rill. Uh, it's a very, very, very similar pic uh, pattern to the step-by-step step one we did earlier and uh, it went down well so soon after that first ledger had a second one for central pier at blackpool which i also painted but in a different color scheme uh, i had quite a long association with jackson's and uh, enjoyed every minute of it there was a period 10 or 12 years ago when horses from gallopers were starting to come into the collections of preservationists and uh, I got uh, quite a few over the years, I've done quite a few. Um, we've done uh, grey ones, we've done cream ones, cream ones are the most popular traditional uh, type. Uh, some want more detail like this one than the others. It's down to personal preference, just like the showman. They, they want more or they don't. And I think the most unusual one I ever had to do was this zebra. 
That was quite a challenge. Uh, for that, I had to consult Paul Wright. Me not being a picture man, we had to get the stripes right. So Paul advised me on that. Well, as time goes on, and you get to do different things and meet different people, uh, you have to do different jobs for different situations. Not being a picture man, uh, as I freely admit, uh, I wanted to have a go at a little bit of something. So uh, a collector stroke preservationist had bought this Noah's Ark front and it had been stored in a damp location and in places it's down to the white primer. Uh, could I make it good? Well, I'll have a go, that's my answer. So he brought it over, I looked at it, and I thought, whoo, I can only do parts of this. There's a big piece here where there's a horse with half, half its leg missing. It's in a bad way. I can't do that. Who's the man to help me? Good old Paul Wright. Turn to Paul, help every time, as much help as you want. Yes, I'll sort it out for you, he said. He came down, spent a couple of days here, and did all the picture part, and there's the result and I did the scroll work and that's before and after. From the same ride, the Ashley Brothers ride, uh, this particular panel has had a pretty hard life and you can see that the end upright has had to be totally replaced. Unfortunately it cuts right through the head of a wild cat and not a friendly looking one either, pretty wild. So we've now got to match up not only to redo the half of the wildcat that's missing, but it's got to match the next board that butts up to it on the right. Pretty hell of a challenge. I didn't know what to do. So then it's on the phone again. Paul, help me out, Paul. Paul said, I'm not going to do it for you this time. I'm going to let you do it yourself, but I'll guide you. So he came down, spent more time with me, took me through it. You can see the four major steps there gradually got through it and that's the finished product. Some of the jobs we do are pretty big. Uh, the waltzers usually have quite a big front to them which can take the whole of this back wall being they can be anywhere from 24 to 40 foot in length uh, which is quite a challenge when you think of a, a big piece of canvas like that. What we do is we start with the drawing to scale as a rule, not always, but more often than not. Uh, and once it's been approved, then it's a case of drawing a grid over it, a 12 inch square grid or a 6 inch square grid, depending on the scale of the thing. And then just drawing it on, scaling it up. If it's a rounding board or a shutter from a waltzer, then it's going to be mass production and they'll usually be uh, as on the Cadona wall, so they'll usually be a left, right, left, right, left, right, all the way around. So then you just make a pattern that you can reverse uh, as opposed to one big scene on the front of the ride. And to make a pattern that's reversible, I use tracing paper and I draw the pattern onto the board first, trace that board and then perforate the pattern and then we, we rub over that with a, a bag full of chalk powder or pounce powder as it's called in the trade uh, and all the little holes form dots onto the panel which you're going to paint and that's something, a guideline to follow. Uh, and that's what we do on each board, it's mass production style. So if you've got 20 rounding boards or 20 shutters to do all the same that's the only economical way of doing it so then it's just like painting by numbers after that but there's no numbers <laughs> so you just put the colours wherever you want